Thanks for listening to this archive of Teaching American History's last Documents in Detail webinar for the 2019-2020 school year. Recorded on May 13th, 2020, the focus of tonight's program was Herbert Hoover's speech on the proposed New Deal, which he delivered shortly before the 1932 election. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Moser. I am Professor of History and Chair of the Master of Arts in American History and Government Program at Ashland University, sporting my coronavirus lockdown haircut. Uh, Welcome to another episode of Documents in Detail, teachingamericanhistory.org's webinar series in which we bring together thoughtful scholars to have a conversation about historically important documents. We encourage all of you joining us today to participate in that conversation by submitting questions via the chat box. I prefer that you use the chat box rather than the Q&A box, just so we can keep it all in one place. Um, and we will try to get to as many of your questions as possible. Within the next week, you will receive an email with a link to request a certificate of participation, as well as a link to the archived video and audio from today's program. The speeches, letters, and other writings that we're using for this year's webinars are all drawn from our book, 50 Core American Documents. If you are not familiar with that book, you should be. Those documents are also available at the Ashbrook Center's extensive, voluminous even, document database located at tah.org. The subject of tonight's program is Herbert Hoover's 1932 campaign speech, consequences of the proposed New Deal. And to help discuss it tonight are Joseph Postel, Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs, and Abby Lynn Sellers, Associate Professor of Politics at Azusa Pacific University. Uh, Joe, Abby Lynn, nice to have you with us tonight. Thank you, good to be here. Good to be here. I always like to start out these things by throwing out uh, a, a very general question. Um, why, uh, what's so significant about this document? Why is it worth remembering? So important that it gets, uh, it gets put into a collection called 50 Core American Documents. What do you think, Abby Lynn? Oh, okay. Well, I, I'll go first. So I, Joe and I kind of touched base before. We're both going to touch on kind of some different things uh, with this document. So I focus more specifically on the rhetoric uh, of the document itself. And really this election, this 1932 election had a significant effect on what is known as the rhetorical presidency. And just a brief background, the framers did not intend uh, for the American presidency to be rhetorical. If you're uh, the executive turning into a demagogue, um, they didn't want someone who was going to appeal to the passions of the people. Uh, But obviously this changed uh, as time went forward, particularly in the early uh, 20th century. uh, TR was kind of known as the the father of the rhetorical presidency and he used rhetoric uh, to promote policy objectives, uh, both with Congress and the American public, Uh, but he did so in a way that did not uh, appeal over the heads of Congress. Uh, He didn't undermine the deliberative process of Congress, so he was fairly cautious in how he utilized his rhetoric, but specifically uh, for Hoover uh, in this election, he was the first incumbent president to actually go out on the stump to campaign actively uh, for the presidency, so again, as an incumbent. Um, And both Hoover and FDR gave over, I don't know, 100 prepared speeches uh, for this uh, election. A lot of them were uh, radio addresses, um, and because radio uh, was more uh, common in uh, people's homes, they had to kind of tweak their campaign speeches so people weren't hearing the same thing over and over. Um, But what's interesting, uh, particularly with this speech, uh, prior to giving it, Uh, During the Great Depression and leading up to the election, Hoover really didn't utilize the rhetorical presidency to his advantage. Um, He really reduced his speaking schedule. Uh, He relied um, kind of more on this idea of, it's called a wall of silence. Uh, 
But he did this by justifying it, saying he didn't want to talk about uh, economics and kind of the problems of the nation because he feared that it would induce further panic among the American public. Um, but when he did speak, uh, he had a phrase, prosperity is just around the corner. Uh, this rhetoric kind of came across as being disingenuous to the American public. Um, and then also factored into this was his personality. Hoover uh, really didn't like public speaking. He was pretty shy. Um, but he had to do something at this point uh, in the game when this speech was given. It was in October of 1932. Um, and he had to kind of be on the uh, defensive after all of the um, negative uh, press that he and his administration had been receiving. Um, and so uh, Hoover's press secretary, uh, Theodore Jocelyn, actually wrote in his diary that Hoover saw FDR as a, a demagogue uh, who was uh, seeking opportunism. And, uh, and so Hoover had to present himself as the opposite of all of those things. So I think the speech uh, really, in the rhetorical sense, um, is Hoover attempting to do those things. Very interesting. Joe. Um, yeah, so I have to admit, it's a good question to open things up because um, I have to admit that I've never read this speech before getting prepared for this discussion. I've read plenty of Hoover speeches, the rugged individualism speech, the constructive side of government speech, but this one um, I had actually never read before until about a month ago. Uh, so it's a great question. Why uh, study this speech? And I think my answer to that question is that this speech represents a turning point in the two political parties and their philosophies of government. Um, Hoover presents is he presents this speech as laying out a contrast between two competing philosophies of government. He says something almost exactly along those lines. But this is this election, 1932, is about two different philosophies of government. Um, and then he sort of proceeds to lay out what he sees as the differences between those two philosophies. I think it would be interesting to sort of try to figure out what he saw as the main differences and whether he was right about that. But what I, what I find fascinating about this speech is if you read just the speech without any of the context surrounding it, it's very interesting. Hoover's basically saying, I couldn't be more diametrically opposed to FDR. And yet, if you know the historical context around this, you know that it's much more complicated. And Hoover was actually much less sort of conservative than we often think him to be. And FDR, at least in 1932, was presenting himself as pretty conservative Democrat, more in line with the Democratic Party's more conservative or limited government tradition. And so what's interesting about the speech, I guess, is that you start to see the Republican Party going on a new path, and especially the way that Hoover uh, sort of describes Roosevelt's position in 32, you start to see the Democratic Party going on a very different path as well. And this is a this is kind of a speech at the turning point. And I think that's one important reason why it should be studied. Uh, Abby Lynn, a, a quick follow up to your to your comments. I, I'm interested of, uh, to the extent that this is a, this is a reflection of the rhetorical presidency or, or what Hoover was able to do with it. Anyhow, um, anyone who has listened to recordings of Hoover uh, probably concludes pretty quickly that he is not a, he's not a terrific public speaker. Um, did he have a speech writer? Uh, you know, I actually don't know the answer to that question. I assume he did. Um, he had, I, I know that for this particular campaign, he was trying to shove a lot of the campaigning off on a lot of his administration. He didn't want to have to do that himself. So I, I'm, I'm sure he had someone assisting him with that. Um, yeah, this is. It, 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 I never really, you never really hear about Hoover speechwriters, probably because they they weren't all that good. Um, I mean, when you when you think about FDR, on the other hand, who had this constellation of big names, and and I, I know some historians who say that if you if the first thing you have to do in analyzing any FDR speech is figure out who the speechwriter was, because that because it, it could be it, it could have a very different emphasis depending on who the speechwriter. So yeah, I was wondering if. I, Hoover wrote his own. Um, 
let's talk a little bit about the uh, about the context for this speech. It's it's, it's a it's just a, a week or so before the election, right? Any? You want to take that first? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, so um, you get a little bit of a sense of the context from the quote that Hoover gives at the very end. He quotes a very famous paragraph from Roosevelt's Commonwealth Club Address, which I'm pretty sure is also one of the 54 documents. Um, and I think what Hoover's figuring out, uh, this is an interesting thing maybe to talk about whether this is the right way to interpret the speech, but Hoover's figuring out that FDR isn't a typical Democrat, like say Al Smith, his opponent in 1928. Um, the Commonwealth Club essentially lays out a sort of philosophy of government where um, the argument is essentially that the, the frontier has closed. That means quality of opportunity no longer exists in the same way that it used to. So now government has to be much more active and interventionist to kind of administer supply and demand, plan an economy, give everybody a quality of opportunity. Um, and Hoover, I think, might be figuring out that Roosevelt's proposals uh, especially, you know, the New Deal, the very idea of a New Deal is that things are going to be fundamentally restructured if FDR were to win the election. I think Hoover's figuring out that this is not a typical Democrat he's facing. So he's trying to draw attention to the fact that um, FDR is more radical than he might have portrayed himself to be at various times during the campaign. So um, I guess maybe that's that's maybe part of the context uh, here. And also I get the sense Hoover knows he's in big trouble. Um, so he's, he's trying to draw back into a bigger sort of philosophical question in hopes that he can portray his, can, portray his opponent in a way that's gonna, I don't know if this is like a Hail Mary speech or something like that. Um, uh, these are maybe speculations. It's hard to say exactly what he had on his mind when he gave a speech like this, but. I think he's starting to put some pieces together and he knows what, what's at stake in 1932 and that this is kind of a new trajectory for the Democratic Party if FDR were to be elected. Abby Lynn, care to add to that? Yeah, so I think that um, in terms of Hoover, again, didn't really start campaigning himself until the month of October in 1932. and he really had to give a self-defense uh, of his administration and of his, himself um, for their action in the past uh, couple years. Uh, they had been blamed, he had been vilified, um, he'd been charged for lacking rhetorical skills. So you can kind of look at this speech as his apologia. So um, in speaking of defense, and FDR's strategy, of course, was to be on the attack. Uh, and to paint Hoover as being devoid of any type of compassion for the American public. Um, and so he had to defend beyond the defensive uh, and defend his administration, his character, and as is seen, his view of government, which is quite prevalent uh, in this speech. And so it kind of has this ideological divide that's present. Um, and so, and kind of pull out is there is this traditional administrative president and with Hoover candidate as a candidate and then the other choice is this modern rhetorical president in, in FDR and so the American public has this choice and they have to choose between the two. So this um, Hoover has to try to do a little uh, 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 use some deduction to try to figure out what the New Deal even is supposed to be about, right? Because after all, FDR doesn't say a lot about what he proposes to do while he's on the campaign trail. I think the the two things he consists, or the three issues he consistently returns to is he wants to cut spending, uh, he wants to um, uh, he wants to uh, open up, he wants to get lower tariffs, right? Traditional Democratic uh, talking point. And he wants to get rid of prohibition, but aside from that, he remains pretty cagey. So, how is it? I mean, what, what do we think of Hoover's efforts to try and identify a coherent philosophy behind a, a, a campaign that doesn't seem to have a whole lot of substance at this point? 
Well, I don't think he does a very good job of that um, in this speech for precisely the reasons you're bringing up. Um, there's a lot of rhetoric in the New Deal, but there's not a lot of a record for FDR to uh, to be accountable to. So that's one part of it. And the other part of it, we sort of hinted at this, but I think it's worth making making it sort of concrete here. The other problem with drawing this contrast or to teasing out what's going on with FDR's rhetoric is that so much of what Hoover's criticizing in this speech is what Hoover himself had been doing for the last several years in response to the Depression. So um, again, this is why I think the context of the speech tells such a different story than the speech itself. Um, you know, probably some of the people watching this are familiar with the interesting historical trivia here about how FDR praised Hoover greatly in the run-up to the 1920 presidential campaign. I think he tried to recruit Hoover to be uh, the Democratic Party's candidate, said something along the lines of, I wish we could make Hoover president of the United States in 1920. He'd be the, he's the best person for the job. Um, and the reason they all thought this of Hoover was because he was not like Calvin Coolidge. He was not a stand pat conservative. He wasn't a laissez-faire um, Republican. And so when Hoover starts to criticize government intervention in banking, um, he has contrasting that with his own views, which his own policies, which he's now, uh, that's his record, right? That, that is fair for everybody to see. So um, I think the contrast is so much greater in the speech than it is in, in the record. And I think that's one of the problems that Hoover has here. That's why I think the speech might be considered to be an unsuccessful one. Yeah. I, I, I always find I always tell students to their surprise that that, that Hoover was a was a, a a big fan of Teddy Roosevelt. He was he was from the progressive wing of the uh, of the Republican Party. Abby Lynn, do you care to add to that? Oh no, you're, Joe said it all. <laughs> we do have our uh, our first question from uh, someone uh, in the audience. Uh, Andrew says, interesting to see some of the choice language Hoover uses, like, quote, conscripted citizens leading to the destruction of their liberties, unquote, in his second point analysis of the New Deal I uh, ideas. Pretty powerful leveraging of fear. Either of you care to comment on that? Go ahead, Abilene. Here. So, sorry. Is uh, is is Hoover? Uh, is is this just a, a naked appeal to emotion to try and uh, to try and scare the voters? Um, I'm not. Sure. <laughs> I don't think I want to say no to that question. Um, yeah. This, I think. This question is really hitting on something here that Hoover's rhetoric um, is pretty extreme. Um, I think in, with the benefit of hindsight, we can see that Hoover might have been right about FDR's radicalism, but at the time it was hard to see how he could have made such claims um, uh, given his record and given you know that FDR was part of a party that was at least somewhat friendly to decentralization and limited government that the Democratic Party traditionally had been. So um, one of the things, I guess, another point of context around the speech is that once FDR becomes president, um, Hoover goes on this massive speaking tour against FDR. And, uh, you know, somebody was raising this point um, to me a few months ago, you know, have there been any presidents who've been more critical of current presidents than the former presidents have been critical of President Trump. And my first response was to say, Herbert Hoover was pretty critical of his successor. Um, so in some ways there's some foreshadowing going on in this speech that, that the rhetoric that Hoover never used up to this point is now gonna be what he's gonna start using from, from here on out. Yeah, so I think that he wants to make there a clear distinction in terms of the difference of their philosophies of, of government. Uh, and that's definitely one of Hoover's rhetorical tools, uh, and it was in a number of his speeches at the end here. But this is the American principles aspect is really a, a main thrust of this New York speech um, in terms of 
the adherence uh, to the principles of government and the appeals to the founding era. Um, he does talk about self-government and individual responsibility. Um, democracy can remain the master in its own house and can preserve the fundamentals of our American system. So um, it's not surprising that he would draw in that language um, to make that, that contrast. But as Joe says, um, how he would have had that kind of I don't know, foresight to know for sure uh, that FDR's policies would indeed do these types of things. Um, speculation maybe on his behalf, so. We have a question from Shailen asking, um, asking you to comment on the, the relationship between these two men. They really didn't like each other, right? This became a, this election was kind of personal, wasn't it? Yeah, well, I think it depends on which period of time we're talking about here. So um, absolutely, the election itself soured the relationship between these two. And there is a really good book that's been written recently about the transition between um, Hoover and Roosevelt. And basically, Hoover kind of set up a lot of obstacles in FDR's way so that when he became president after the 32 election, um, he would face difficulties, he would have some obstacles to overcome, kind of a foreshadowing again of the rise of partisanship, of polarization, and of um, some of the things we're seeing more recently. Um, but if you go back before the election, the relationship's completely different. It's very cordial. Uh, and again, that's, I think, for me, one of the great stories of this speech and this election is how did people who agreed on everything and acted upon their agreement for a long period of time come to such loggerheads uh, at this uh, at this moment. So, um, you know, Hoover, when he was another point that many may know, he was the food administrator for Woodrow Wilson. So he was actually uh, trying to think of comparisons to today, but he had undertaken a great effort during World War One to basically run the food supply of the country, and everybody sort of acknowledged that. As a kind of engineer, as a technocrat, Hoover was maybe the best of his generation. Um, FDR called him a wonder. Coolidge called him wonder boy, but he wasn't meaning it as a compliment. Uh, and so Hoover endeared himself to many Democrats, many progressive Democrats, including FDR. And suddenly things just go off the rails in 32 in terms of the relationship between them. It's really, it goes, it gets even worse after the election, it seems. Abby Lynn? Yeah, I agree with Joe, um, particularly the the after the election in 36, uh, with Hoover really actively going after FDR publicly uh, as a past president. So I, I actually I had read about that uh, just recently. I didn't I wasn't as familiar with that specifically, but um, yeah, definitely soured relationship at this point. So I'd like to talk a bit about the American system. I know this is a this is a trope that 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 Hoover uh, touches on in some of his uh, some of his speeches back in 1928. Um, what is he talking about here? What does he mean by the American system? He, he refers to the importance of equality of opportunity. Of course, FDR in his Commonwealth Club address says, "Well, yeah, equality of opportunity is very important. Uh, unfortunately, we've lost it. And we need to get it back." When, what, what is Hoover talking about exactly when he mentions an American system? Yeah, so um, the phrase is most typically associated with Henry Clay, obviously, um, who was a Whig, but the way I tend to talk about these things is he was a Republican before there was a Republican Party. Uh, most of the Whigs became Republicans, and of course, most of the Whigs were old Federalists. So there's this kind of line between Hamilton Henry Clay, Lincoln, and then people like um, Herbert Hoover. Um, so the idea of an American system, I think he's trying to appeal to kind of roots of his own political party. And again, this is a sort of subtlety that we don't teach well enough or it'd be good for us to teach um, more clearly. The, the Republican Party for a century prior to 20th century was, was the party of I guess you would say union of central government, at least compared to the, to the opposition Democrats. And so um, that, that idea of an American system is basically the idea that the 
national government has some positive responsibilities. They're still limited, but they're positive. Government needs to kind of create infrastructure, needs to set the conditions for people to exercise their freedom, to engage in economic activity. And yet, government's positive approach or positive responsibility sort of end those limited uh, objectives. So I think what Hoover's trying to do is to show that he's not a libertarian or a laissez-faire, or to use some of the terms that we'd associate with people today. He believes in positive government. He used the phrase constructive government in 1928, but that government still has a limit to it as well. Government should be active, but not unlimited. Um, and so this American system, I guess, is his notion of, you know, government has these, these essential responsibilities and it shouldn't shy away from exercising those, those functions. But then FDR presents something more than that. It's not just effective government with limited responsibilities. It's just unlimited government and centralization all the way. Um, and I think that subtlety, we tend to see things in binaries today, right? either you're against government or you're for government. And Hoover represents a sort of pro-government, but a limited government kind of approach, which I think um, we, should be, we should be capable of teaching students and teaching people that these categories, you know, there's a lot of nuance between these kinds of binaries that we're often presenting in textbooks. So, so government, we, you need an active government, but there are certain lines that must not be crossed. And I mean, right. Lynn, anything you care to add to that? Yeah, so he talks about this idea of decentralization. And so um, one of the you know, core tenets of the, the founding in terms of the government is the government needs to be limited. Um, and with the separation of powers, of course, but it needs to be decentralized and not all powerful. And so Hoover points back to this fact that uh, there are responsibilities, yes, that the government has, but it, it should not hold all the power, of course. So. Um, he, of course, spends a lot of this, uh, a lot of this address trying to defend his own record during a period of deep economic crisis. Uh, how, how good a job do you think he does at that? Well, I won't speak to the rhetoric, um, which I think he fails rhetorically, uh, but I'll speak to maybe the validity of the argument, which is a different question. Um, so he calls, uh, if I remember this from about halfway through the speech, he calls it his major thesis um, that we should take the long view and his, his argument is, well, the last three years have been abysmal. Three years where I've been president have been really bad. But if you go back 30 years, oh, it looks really good. And maybe he hasn't been president for 30 years, but the people listening to Hoover will know that the Republicans have largely been uh, in the president, in, in the White House for the last 30 years, right? You have Harding, you have Coolidge, you have Roosevelt before him, and then basically Woodrow Wilson is kind of a the one exception to that period of Republican Party dominance. So he's, I think he's trying to persuade people that maybe I haven't done a good job or you won't judge that I have been an effective president, but we've got a good track record here. This is just a short period of contraction. Um, I think rhetorically it's got to fail because people are suffering and they don't want to hear that things have gotten better over the last 30 years. They want to know what's happened in the last three. But I find it to be at least intellectually persuasive that he's right about the trajectory of the country. And I think there's something really powerful here at the end of the speech where he takes this, this argument about the Commonwealth Club address and he says, what FDR is saying is the era of American growth and expansion is over. The frontier has closed. We basically, we can't grow anymore. We can't make any more progress. Now all we're left to do is to kind of administer what we've created over the last 150 years. Um, he calls it uh, a note of profound pessimism in FDR's speech. And he says, I'm the optimistic progressive. I'm telling you that technology and science are going to get so much better over the next 50 years or the next few decades. Look at the radio, look at the automobile. This is, this is a temporary, you know, contraction, but look at what we can create. And 
there's a new frontier opening, and that's the frontier of science and technology. And honestly, I think he's probably got the better of the argument on that. But people listening to the speech probably were not interested in that argument. They wanted to know what government was going to do for them right now. And FDR was willing to give them something right away. Abby Lynn. Yeah, I agree. Uh, definitely fails rhetorically uh, in attempting to disassociate his administration uh, from the charge of basically being responsible for the Great Depression. And so he tries to place the blame on Europe uh, and the war um, and its aftermath. Um, and he also uses a number of metaphors. Um, he, he includes these natural disasters. So he equates, uh, he says, further blow by the shocks transmitted to us from earthquakes of the collapse of nations throughout the world. And he also talks about a storm uh, that we may think God in view of the storm that we've met, 30 million still have jobs, but you know, a certain number don't. And so, uh, I mean, his intention of doing that probably was that human beings don't have any control over uh, whether or not a natural disaster takes place or not. So he, he's trying to deflect uh, his administration for being responsible and uh, using this kind of language, but I don't think that he's very successful uh, in doing so. Where do you think Hoover, and maybe this takes us away a little bit from the speech itself, where do you think Hoover went wrong? I mean, it, it's not as though uh, it's not as though there hadn't been panics and stock, you know, big plummets in the stock market in the past. Clearly, by 1932, it was clear that this was not like uh, the Panic of 1907 or or something that's often forgotten the the the, the recession or, or depression even of 1921, which in fact, Hoover was Secretary of Commerce at the time. Hoover was ready to jump into action. He was ready to hold a bunch of meetings. And, and then it improved before he could even get into it. What's different? And where did Hoover go wrong as, as, as president? I think he went wrong by not appealing to the public. So by choosing to, from a rhetorical sense, by choosing to pull back in a time of crisis, uh, people want to know that their leader uh, is in charge and in control and uh, and has compassion toward their plight. And he did not demonstrate that uh, at all. He came across as cold and uncaring and completely disassociated. And that did not go over well with the American public in a time of crisis. Joe. Uh, yeah, so this is a question that is, uh, filled with landmines, and it's going to get into, I guess, maybe some sort of uh, contemporary partisan kind of debates. Um, I think probably, I, I really don't know the answer of what Hoover did wrong. And I think speaking from a sort of policy point of view, that he basically presided over a really awful depression and he didn't do anything to reverse it. Um, some people, you know, this gets back to the question of what caused the Great Depression and therefore what should have been done to to address it. Um, many people will talk about, say, like Slew Hawley tariff or restrictions on uh, trade, the protective tariff as being a really bad idea that Hoover uh, shouldn't have supported. This was a traditional Republican Party view that we should promote domestic manufacturing by um, keeping trade or keeping manufacturing here through the tariff. Um, the international, I mean, Hoover himself says it's the international crisis, really, what's going on around the world is what's caused our problems. So um, we have to deal with it that way. Uh, some people will argue that Hoover's activism, basically that Hoover himself was taking on many of the things that FDR would eventually do, that that extended the Great Depression, and that therefore FDR also extended the Great Depression by some of the measures that he took. Um, I don't necessarily think I'm qualified to answer that question definitively, but um, I, I think, Hoover's failure, in some sense, um, is a bit of a revisionist history. I, I mean, it's hard to defend Herbert Hoover. It's hard to say he wasn't a failed president. It's, it's one of the things that historians almost entirely agree upon is that he was. But, you know, Hoover did what FDR eventually would do, at least in many respects. Um, all of the interventions, farm subsidies, increasing government expenditures, 
creating things like the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. These were basically core ideas of the New Deal. And um, the great line from one of FDR's brains trusts, he says, you know, we got here and we found that the New Deal had essentially already been underway thanks to Herbert Hoover. He had been doing it. Um, and so there's, I guess, a bit of a tragedy here that we tend to praise FDR for what he did in response to the Great Depression, and yet Hoover did many of the same things before FDR did, and yet we call him a failed president. Um, you know, they say, right, that the winners write the histories, and in this case, they wrote it to Hoover's detriment. So, um, so there are many ways of thinking about Hoover as a failed president. I guess in a way, I want to try to at least say he wasn't a failed president of the way we ordinarily think he was. You know, to 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 Abby Lynn's point, th this rhetorical element would seem to be to be pretty important. Um, on the one hand, Hoover seemed like the kind of guy that you wanted to have in the White House when a crisis hit. After all, he had handled, as as Joe pointed out, the uh, he had headed up the U.S. Food Administration and and, and it really oversaw an extremely effective relief effort to Europe. Uh, in 1927, when there was a devastating, there was devastating flooding on the Mississippi River, uh, he was in charge of the relief efforts there, and again did a really great job. Um, and they called him the great engineer because he was the guy who would figure out what to do and then solve the problems. But it was those of us who know engineers, right, know that they have a really hard time communicating in a way that conveys empathy. And in that vein, uh, we have a question from Danita Courtney. Is this document an effective tool to use in teaching the rhetoric of today's government reaction to the pandemic and the polarization of the American people? What do you think? I say, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, um, absolutely. Uh, we're in a in a presidential election year. So uh, everything that's gonna be said is gonna be scrutinized and, and we have more um, media at our disposal uh, now. And so we have a tendency, I would say for your students that you can challenge them, uh, particularly with this speech, um, and, and, and asking them how the failure of Hoover's unrhetorical presidency helped to bolster FDR's uh, rhetorical presidency. So would FDR have been as successful uh, if Hoover would have been able to convey these things rhetorically? Um, but it definitely is a, a good link to today in terms of what information is conveyed to the public. Now, of course, there's you got to sift through all of the the media and how things are, are presented, um, which, you know, working with your students to identify, um, you know, what's true and what's spin. Um, but I would say absolutely that you could make the, the linkage of, of the importance of the rhetor the rhetorical presidency in a time of crisis uh, and how information is conveyed and particularly in a campaign season. Um, how it's going to be utilized, um, uh, the crisis will be utilized and what will the, what the focus will be in order to um, either justify uh, or defend a particular administration, the incumbent, or what the challenger is going to do differently. Obviously, the challenger is going to point out the, the failures of the current administration, um, but the, the rhetoric, it, it, it's really important um, and it's, I think that it makes us as citizens, um, it should make us less lazy. Um, we should be paying attention to actually what's being said, and that's something that you can challenge your students with. Joe. I think you can see the roots of polarization in this speech. Um, this gets back to some of the things we've been saying at the beginning here about how here's Hoover, a sort of progressive Republican, and FDR attacking him from the sort of the right, and yet Hoover now is starting to attack in this rhetoric, FDR as being to the left, and he's positioning himself to the right. And so I think you can start to see the kind of shifting out of the parties into two kind of um, polarized camps. I think this speech 
in many ways is a sign of the beginning of that process that students really do not understand very well. So um, I teach a course on political parties, but I teach courses on a lot of different aspects of American politics. And in almost every single class, I have to tell my students that until very recently, there were uh, Republicans on both the left and the right, and there were Democrats on both the left and the right. And a lot of the fighting and the political conflict was really within the parties themselves. And that somehow has changed over the last generation or two. The students don't really understand that it hasn't always been this way. Um, and they always are interested in knowing when this happened, why it happened. And I think this speech in particular does kind of show the beginning of that process that Hoover is taking a position and he's saying that the other side has this diametrically opposed philosophy of government and that we're at a turning point between those two those two philosophies. So um, in the midst of this particular election, where we, we now call every election the contest of two diametrically opposed philosophies of government, the nation is at stake. I think this speech actually is kind of a, an interesting first instance or early instance maybe of that sort of thing happening in our rhetoric. That's very interesting. I've been I've been looking a lot at the election of 1912 lately, and in many ways that was a contentious election. I mean, Wilson and and Teddy Roosevelt certainly went at each other with gusto, but yeah, at it, it, no point did the rhetoric come to the point of this is a diamet right. We, these are diametrically opposed systems, and one will lead us to perdition, while the other will uh, will preserve our institution. So that, that that's a very interesting. Uh, I've got a couple more questions here. Uh, Jerry Elix, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, asks, did it seem that Hoover was detached from the needs of the general public when he gave this speech? He may have been correct about many things on Roosevelt, but does it seem that Hoover was a little more Vulcan where he should have been more human? What do you think? Yeah, I think definitely probably comes across that way because he's, again, trying to defend. So he's on the defensive. And so when you're on the defensive, you can't really demonstrate that humanity, I guess, if you want to call it that, um, because you've got to be able to, uh, it, it's, just, it's just a different approach to a, a speech. And so I, I, when I read this, I, I find it is, it's just defense. Um, of his administration, of American principles, and so it, it, it doesn't come across as it was his problem throughout this whole campaign, as, as you point out, as being human and relatable. So whereas, and Hoover wasn't charismatic. Um, FDR definitely had the charisma, and, and that's something that was one of my uh, takeaways for you as teachers um, and why a question that you could ask your students is, is how important is it to pay attention to the substance of a speech versus the style of how it's delivered? So um, it's something that they can think about um, and when you obviously read it, but then if you listen to it too, um, those are some things you can focus on. Yeah, I think that's, um, that's very much, Right. <laughs> There's this sort of the, the substance of the speech, I actually think, is is pretty serious and very good, which I guess is why it merits inclusion on this 54 documents list. Um, there's a lot to unpack here. Hoover's central claim, it seems to me, um, for us today, as it, as it relates to us today, is whether you can change what government is doing without changing the fundamentals on which it is it is based. The Hoover's argument is, I've never been against government intervention on behalf of people. I've always been for government helping people. My record is evidence of that. What we've done in response to the Great Depression is unprecedented. We have dramatically expanded government, but I don't think that means we have to just completely wipe out the constitution and the sort of decentralized system that it sets up. Um, we can we can update our policies without changing our principles. That's the basic argument that Hoover is making. And that distinction between policies and principles 
um, is something that people really have a hard time understanding. But I think it's a it's a serious substantive argument. It's, I find it compelling. But again, that doesn't win elections every time. Making the most substantively serious argument, the most intellectually compelling argument. And um, but you know, Hoover. I don't think anybody should have expected that from Hoover when he was put up for president in 1928. Uh, if you were going to get somebody who was going to be a rhetorically compelling leader, that's not what he built his reputation on. He built his reputation as a manager, as an engineer. And so um, it's true that when faced with this crisis, he didn't have the rhetorical skills really to, to, uh, to respond effectively. But um, that's more of a question for 1932. The question for us today is we read it and teach it is whether there was a path not taken, maybe that Hoover presented government being engaged in supplying relief without maybe the more extraordinary measures that that FDR was willing to do. Yeah, you know, it, it seems to me that, that the contest in 1932 is really, I mean, this is a fight about expertise. And Hoover really, all, he always put himself forward as, as the expert. But the thing about experts is they're usually not inspiring. And, and and so when you know when when his expertise just seemed by 1932 people were really questioning questioning his level of expertise. But as far as as, as Hoover was concerned, FDR was a was a lightweight, right? He didn't really know anything. He just had a nice smile and he was a good speaker and could and could impress people on the uh, uh, out on the campaign trail. But he really didn't have the know-how in order to tackle uh, to tackle problems and uh and, you know in the end of course the, the american people went for uh, went for fdr uh we've got another question uh was hoover accurate in con this is from james hooper was hoover accurate in conveying the data relating to the economic catastrophe other than the reputed remark that prosperity is just around the corner Joe, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to find actually sort of what the claims are exactly here in the speech. Um, it's just the delay here in the response. Uh, so the question is, was the the data that Hoover gave in the speech accurate? Was he accurate about the economic situation of the country? Um, uh, is that the question? That is that's my understanding of it. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not entirely sure. I can't answer that necessarily definitively, but I think largely he is right that both about the sort of long-term progress that the nation has experienced. Certainly, I think he's right about that, um, and about kind of the the you know the unemployment statistics, but also right. He mentions 15 million new and better homes, um, the expansion of electricity. Uh, telephones, radios, automobiles, and things like that. I think he's largely right about those things. So, um, again, this is maybe a counter argument to the, what we've been saying for the last five minutes or so, which is, uh, he's a terrible rhetorician. Uh, it's a paragraph about in the middle of the, the speech where he basically just lays out a ton of facts about how much life has gotten better for people over the course of the last um, few decades. So, you know, he's actually telling people, this is how your life has gotten better. This is how we've improved the lives of people. Um, but that's, you know, again, it's over 30 years, not over the last three. I mean, maybe that is just, at the end of the day, Hoover was just overcome by circumstances. It wasn't that his rhetoric was lacking or he, he just wasn't up to the challenge of speaking the way FDR did. I mean, this was just an extraordinary situation that swept away somebody who was now misunderstood because of that, that situation. Abby, Abby Lynn, sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. So, yeah, I mean, I agree with Joe. Um, I mean, I don't have 100% <laughs> knowing how, if he was 100% accurate in stating his facts, but a lot of times the American public has a very short attention span and rattling off a bunch of statistics is not something that's going to inspire, as you mentioned before, or interest them. Uh, what What is it doing for them now? And so that that's not... Hoover doesn't really, even though he presents the information uh, as factual as it may be in here, it's there's a disconnect between being able to deliver it to the people directly. 
It, it seems to me that, that it's something about understanding your audience, because uh, FDR, if you read his Commonwealth Club address, he, he, uses, he uses statistics, and in many ways, the Commonwealth Club address is a, is a very erudite speech, but he delivered that to a group of fairly well-off uh, businessmen and other you know, worthies of, uh, in, in San Francisco. On the other hand, Herbert Hoover is up in front of a massive crowd in Madison Square Garden. This, yeah, this this is probably not the kind of speech that you want to that, that that you want to deliver in that uh, in that setting. Um, so, why does why exactly does he does Hoover think uh, a Roosevelt presidency would be so dangerous? Yeah, so um, he says at the beginning of the speech, right, that this is basically an attempt to alter the whole foundations of our national life. <laughs> it's hardly uh, moderate, right? Uh, this is him. We're going to alter the whole foundations of our national life. Um, he sort of gets to it at the end again when he quotes uh, Roosevelt's Commonwealth Club address. He says basically, um, what Roosevelt wants to do is to just get government involved in everything. And this will somehow wipe out individualism. Um, and uh, it strikes me that that argument he's making sort of overlooks the fact exactly what Roosevelt said in the Commonwealth Club Address, which is that I'm going to get government involved so that you can be free, not so that you can, not so that government can take over your life, it's so the government can make you free. Um, in that sense, Hoover was right about this being a really fundamental contest between two different philosophies of government. Right? His, his view is that government's intervention can often destroy freedom, and Roosevelt's argument is that government will act on behalf of freedom. Government's intervention actually frees you. It doesn't make you, make you um, uh, unfree. So, uh, you know, again, all he had was this sort of one paragraph from the Commonwealth Club address that was kind of his argument, right? He didn't have a record of FDR to run against. So he had to sort of um, surmise from some of these statements that FDR had this vision of government that was antagonistic to his own. But it turns out he, he you know, had a lot, that there was a lot of truth in that. that he was right about FDR's ambitions and that they were very different uh, from, from what Hoover and other presidents before Hoover wanted to do. Abby Lynn. So he just makes this very clear distinction about, uh, well, it's in this first third paragraph about how this would destroy the very foundations of the American system of, of life. And so um, just trying to, again, appeal to um, the principles of, of the founding and self-government. Um, and really, it, it's kind of the distinction between the, the progressivist thought and the founders in terms of the government uh, existing for the citizen versus the citizen existing for the government. And so um, he's able to make that distinction fairly clearly uh, with these two um, opposed uh, ideological beliefs between him and FDR. See, well, I mean, what, certainly one thing that he that he focuses on is inflation of the currency, uh, and this, I mean, there was a lot of panic on the on on among Republicans certainly that that if if you leave the gold standard, there is nothing but disaster that awaits. It's almost a little bit amusing in hindsight how uh, how, how overwrought these concerns were. Um, what can you, uh, if anything, can either of you tell me about the the public reaction or the press reaction to this speech? Did it did it make much of an impact? Well, I suppose the obvious uh, data point to look at is the election itself, which happens you know, a lot not more than ten days or so after, not more than a week, I guess, after the, the speech is given. Um, but I get the sense that. Hoover knew very well what the outcome was going to be by the time he gives this speech. So um, I guess I don't know exactly what the reaction was to this specific speech, but uh, clearly it failed to reverse where the, the country was going, where the people were going to go in the election. Um, 
So in some ways, you could interpret this as, you know, this is me taking my stand, even though I know it's not going to work. Um, and I guess that, that sort of lends weight to what we're saying about how rhetoric can be quite understand how to deal with the situation that he's placed in. Um, so it's hard, I don't know what the specific response to this speech was. But clearly, he didn't connect with the American people during this entire campaign, and this is probably just one more example. Abby Lynn? Yeah, I don't know specifically either, uh, like Joe, but I do know that, I mean, I'm pretty certain he, he knew he was not going to win. So at this point, he's just like, well, I'm just going to defend as much as I can my, my presidency and my administration, and what do I got to lose at, at this particular point? There is a question, though, that you could ask your students uh, with this speech in terms of what uh, maybe rhetorical strategies could have made Hoover more effective? Like, would that have even been possible at this point? Um, would it have been better just for him to focus on maybe one or two strong defenses and develop those throughout? Um, like, what could he have done differently, if anything, uh, in order to salvage his campaign? You know, it's, it, um, I think I just lost my, uh... Just lost my train of thought here. Uh, the, the, oh, could could perhaps he have at this point been setting himself up for being the ex, the the critical ex president? Right. Joe had pointed out that that he would, in a way that was really unprecedented for former presidents, to come out and be outspoken in 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 criticizing the uh, uh, the person who beat them. Um, it, it could could. Hoover at this point have actually been thinking, I know I'm going to lose, but now I'm going to put, I'm going to, you know, lay out my uh, my case, and I'm going to revisit this in a few years when uh, when FDR is in office, and I'm going to show everyone why I was right and he was wrong. What do you think? Yeah, so this is an interesting hypothetical to entertain. Because scans, we've given the context of Hoover's career up until 1928, and he was sort of the prototypical establishment politician, respected on both sides of the aisle, worked for both Democrats and Republican presidents, um, had the respect of, of FDR, you know, even his opponent in 1932. So you'd think that the incentives for him would be to play nice and then he could still be in the circles and, you know, who knows whether FDR even could have enlisted him in some of the emergency efforts that were going to be undertaken during the first term of his presidency. So you know, maybe if you put yourself in the mindset of Hoover in 32, you think, OK, things are really bad for me, but, you know, I have this longstanding record of government service and respected on both sides of the aisle. Maybe I should play nice and see how things go and do the best I can for my country and continue to serve the public in the best way I can. But he doesn't do that clearly. If you read the speech, he, he goes on the offensive. I mean, he's defensive, but he's going on the offensive in the sense of he's, he's attacking people that he had a good relationship with before. And I'm not sure whether he's setting himself up for this kind of, um, this kind of rhetoric, rhetorical speaking tour he's about to go on. Maybe he thinks that the Great Depression will be over relatively soon. He has a chance in 36 to go after, uh, he could be the next Grover Cleveland and win two non-consecutive terms. Um, it's an interesting thought experiment, um, but clearly he miscalculated that was his intention. He could somehow re-enter the political fray and be effective. Um, he clearly tries to after he loses, but it, it, it doesn't work out. Abby Lynn, any final thoughts about this document? Um, well, just to kind of answer that last question in terms of it being a little difficult to speculate, I think we have to put ourselves in the position of a, a president who's served for a term uh, in the midst of a, a great crisis and what that does psychologically to a person, physically to a person. So maybe at this point he was just, he was done and he was going <laughs> to go out and um, leave it so and say what he's going to say and and, and so I, I think that those things we just have to remember the what the presidency what kind of effect it has on the, the person um yes. mentally and physically as well 
All right. Well, I want to thank both of our panelists, Joe and Abby Lynn, as well as uh, our participants for their questions. As a reminder, you will be receiving an email within the next week that will include a link for a certificate of participation. That email will also contain a link to the archived webinar, and we hope that you will share that with your colleagues and share it on social media as well. Please help us get the word out. If you've enjoyed tonight's webinar, please consider taking an online graduate course in our Master of Arts in American History and Government program. Uh, both Abby Lynn and Joe teach in that program, and, and you know the kind of conversation that you see tonight is pretty much standard for what we, uh, for what we do. You can find more information about online course offerings, as well as many other resources for teachers at teachingamericanhistory.org. After tonight, Documents in Detail goes on its summer hiatus. But we will be returning on Wednesday, August 19th, when our topic will be Brutus II. We look forward to seeing you then back here for some anti-federalistic goodness <laughs> on August 19th. Uh, until then, have a fantastic summer, and uh, as uh, my colleague Jeff Sickinger likes to say, stay safe, stay fit, stay informed, and stay connected with the Ashbrook Center. Good night. Thanks again for listening. You can find out more information about our upcoming webinars and our archived programs at tah.org slash programs slash webinars.